All right. Good morning, Carolyn Shapiro. I know that person, Carolyn Shapiro. <laughs> Good morning, Dr. David Rosensweet. Good morning. I forgot to put the dear Dr. David Rosensweet on there. I apologize. <laughs> so, as always, welcome everybody. Welcome you. Welcome me. I hope everybody had a fabulous, like, elongated, nice weekend. Restful. Questions come in. They're always good. What can I say? <laughs> and we're going to start. You good with that? Oh, yeah. Okay. Number one, I have suffered from really poor sleep for many years. And I wake four to five times each night to these jolts um, out of a sound sleep, only to be followed by a pretty major hot flash lasting a good 15 minutes. And this happens every night until finally I just get up. I'm soaked, miserable, filled with anxiety. But the weird thing is, is that my days are great. I have energy, no hot flashes. I do a lot and I'm much improved since starting hormones some two and a half years back. Um, my nights though are intolerable and I don't know what to do about this and any advice you have would be greatly appreciated. <laughs> Something's wrong. <laughs> How's that for you think? <laughs> really intelligent medical advice? Yeah. I'd like to say to this questioner that something's wrong because here's the thing with hormones there's only one acceptable um, reaction with hormones, and that's you feel better and everything goes better. Mm -hmm. These are replenishing hormones that are natural to a woman's body. And if something doesn't feel right, especially something as intense as what you just described there, something is wrong. And for someone on hormones, what's missing there is what the dosages are, what the hormones are. But I don't need that information. Um, what I'm hearing is the person is being treated with hormones and she's symptomatic. Yeah, she says two and a half years. Yeah, and so what? What's let's just say it's related to the hormones themselves. Well, if she's waking up in the middle of the night with hot flashes, the very first thing would one would think of is that she has insufficient hormones, just too little. Okay. And hot flashes, too little. Makes sense. However, it's fairly common. A second scenario where she has too much. Right. And what we're talking about here is, number one, mistakes that can be made that can be corrected in the world of treating women in menopause. I learned the hard way. That's I, had woman, I had a woman in her 30s, late 30s. She went into a premature menopause severe hot flashes really severe i gave her hormones and i gave her a regimen to take them starting low and gradually increasing and uh, within a couple of weeks she was still having symptoms of hot flashes in the middle of the night many times just like this patient and i said increase and she kept increasing and she didn't get uh she didn't get any significant response and it was right at the beginning of my career, and I really didn't know what constituted too much or too little. And I, she would get these emails from me practically every other day that she would say, I'm still having hot flashes. And I'd say, we'll increase the dose, increase the estrogen dose. And then I didn't hear back from her a while, for a while. And then I did hear back from her about a couple of weeks later and her hot flashes were as bad as ever. Uh, and, she, and she told me how much she was on, how much hormone was. And the hormone dose was really, really high. And I went, uh oh, she, uh, she could have shot through the pharmacologic window. And we tested her, and indeed, she was super high. And we had her, she was having these severe hot flashes. And I told her to stop taking all hormones. And she got better when she stopped taking hormones. Interesting. And then after a while, 
the hot flash is returned. And I'm sorry to tell too long a story and not, I don't want to make it complicated. Here's what the phenomena is in medicine. It's called the pharmacological window. You got to get your dosages right. You can't have too little or you're not going to get the medicinal effect you want. And you can't have too much because you're not going to get the medicinal effect. It's called the pharmacological window and you got to hit the dosages right within that window. And what that patient has, had done is she had exceeded the pharmacological window. She was still getting symptomatic. She was still getting severe hot flashes. The way I've pictured this is when there's too much hormone, you just flood the receptor sites and you don't get the natural function of receptor sites where the hormone comes in, does its thing, leaves, and it's, a on, and it's an on and an off phenomenon. When you flood, the receptor sites, the hormone comes in, and by the law of mass action, it just stays there, and you don't get the on-off phenomenon. Right. I, I hope that's not too obscure. I want to return us to the basics, that when a woman's having hot flashes in the middle of the night, and she's a menopausal age, and she's on treatment, she's either got too little, estrogen usually, or too much. So that makes it simple. So yeah. what I would suggest to this woman well, first, I'd like to know her dosages. If her dosages were super low, just in general, I'd make a guess that she was on too little and she needed to take more. But if I saw her dosages and they seemed like, wow, that's a big, huge dose, I'd say, ooh, maybe she shot through the pharmacological ceiling there. And here's what I would tell her to do. Stop the hormones and see what happens. If she's got way too much estrogen in her body, she'll get the hot flashes because of the relationship to the receptor sites. And she and and if she stops all these hormones, the estrogen is going to drain out of her body. And here's what I'm listening for. When you stop the hormones, do you feel worse or do you feel better? If you feel worse, well, maybe she wasn't on enough or she wasn't absorbing or something was wrong with the hormone preparation. Mm. But if a woman is having hot flashes in the middle of the night and the dosage is high and she stops all the hormones, including the estrogen, of course, and she feels better, oh my, she was on too much. And we're letting it drain out of her body. And when some enough of it's drained, the hormone that she's got in her body started working again. So what we do in that case is I stay in close contact with her and I get a report every day. You stop the hormones, how you doing? And uh, if she says, oh my God, I feel better. To me, that's direct, powerful evidence that she wasn't too much. But I still stay in contact here with her every single day. And because the time will come when she's in full stoppage of all hormones, that she slips below the pharmacological window. She has too little. And at that point, we have her resume the hormones, however, at a much lower dose. So we, we assume that she was on too much, and we have we start the dose determination process all over again right from the beginning. And what that means is we have her start on low levels of bias, for example, morning and night, and gradually increase and increase slowly. And in her case, if the hot flash is resumed and we started her low, there should come a time where the hot flashes start getting alleviated again. So it we're- would be an amazing feeling for all of us out in menopause land. <laughs> yes, exactly. So that's- <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I feel a little um, humbled there. I, I think I gave way too many words. No. When you, you described a woman who was having severe hot flashes in the middle of the night and she was on, treat, on treatment and I didn't know what her dosage was. So I just went to the two possibilities. She was on too little or she was on too much. 
if I heard the, the amount of milligrams per milliliter she was on and the amount that she was on of biased or estrogen, whatever she was on, and it sounded too high, I'd have her stop. And then we, the proof's in the pudding though. Yeah, nice theory. Doctor thinks she might be have too much, but the proof is in the pudding. She stops and if she starts feeling better, she was on too much. And we keep her off those hormones until she feels better for a while. And then what's going to happen is she's going to get into too low. And then we resume the hormones at a much more gentle, lower rate. I'm kind of speechless. <laughs> <laughs> Why, do you know this person? Uh, I thought I did. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> always a work in progress. It, the interesting thing is that, you know, I, I and, and I'm going to move on to the next question because um, we have some good ones and I appreciate your answer so much. Um, treating oneself for me, Carolyn Shapiro, I personally don't really feel that's a good idea to do. And, um, finding, as you say, an expert who knows what you just said is everything because we're lost, many of us, you know? I mean, who would think stop all hormones? Well, why? You know what I mean? Stop having hot flashes, why stop all hormones? Right, yeah. exactly. I mean, it's terrifying to stop hormones when you feel better. Yeah. You know, so and, it's and the person's days were good. The, the, the that's the weird the thing. Day was days were good. Well, here's the interesting thing. When a woman has an experience like that, and she discovers that, oh my, look at that, I was an overdose, and she gets corrected. One of the things that happens for that woman is she learns more and more and more of how these hormones behave in her body. Yes. And I would like to say that why I wrote that book was over the long haul, I think it is ideal for women to know a certain amount because these hormones are going into the woman's body. Oh, yes. And, I, and I, what I find over years and years and years, I'm 25 years of working with women in menopause, is that women themselves get a feeling for this stuff. Mm -hmm. and they learn so much and how do we learn you know sometimes we learn from direct education or the work of an expert or sometimes we learn from making errors or yeah. doing something different than what is optimal <clears throat> and so women get quite expert at this stuff and it's always been my desire for a woman to get internally expert with this because she can make the adjustments because the hormones are going in her body so if she has some extra stress she knows to, and she gets a few little symptoms. Then what she knows to do is, well, I, I know how these behave. I think I might need a little extra hormone. I'm going to try that theory I have. And she gives herself a little extra. And she gets really expert over time at uh, adjusting things herself and getting them even more accurate clinically. And then we check in on the menopause method. We do an annual 24-hour urine hormone test. We do an annual consultation. But I, I, the only thing I want to say is women do learn how to do this. And, you know, since we're talking about 10, 20, 30, 40 years of treatment. Right. <laughs> for men, too. 10, 20, 30, 40 years of treatment for men. That's mine. My testosterone right there, among the other things I take. It's cool because you get better and better and better at, better at it and you become a, a very active participant in the successful treating of menopause over decades and decades and decades. Right, and I absolutely cannot argue that with you and I wouldn't and um, never. <laughs> um, and I, I love that one can take one's menopause back into one's own hands. Um, yeah. Uh, well, having said that, <laughs> getting it right 
is really important. And thank you for that answer. It's much appreciated, way more than you know. Okay. And I welcome, yeah, I welcome everybody in Joanne and Dr. Berkson and our Facebook users and um, Jimenez, Kathy, everybody. Good morning. Okay, so on to wherever it went. Ah, question number two. Do the ovaries stop working at the same time? Um, and I added in just on my own, why do we have two ovaries anyway and two fallopian tubes? <laughs> 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 just wondering. <laughs> Let me talk to the creator. Uh, yeah. <laughs> or is the creator down there? Or, or... No, he's over here. He's here today. <laughs> he's over there. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's a lot of redundancy in the human body. A lot of organs, there's two of them, not all of them. Like there's two kidneys instead of one. Right. Um, I can't answer why there's two ovaries and two fallopian tubes or why there's two testicles. Or two eyes or two nostrils. Okay. And it sure is a good thing. Um, hi, Devaki. Dr. Brixson's with us. I know. I know. I know. I saw that. Uh huh. Um, Yay. I can't answer, but you know, practically speaking, it barely matters. I mean, it matters when a man has testicular cancer and they remove one of the testicles, or a, a woman has some kind of fallopian tube or ovary issue and they remove one of the ovaries. There you go. You got some redundancy. You can really pick up the, uh, the slack with what you've got remaining. But, um, Someone was thinking ahead, I guess. <laughs> yeah, someone, someone was thinking ahead, but yeah. that's not. It it hardly matters that there's one or two. In general, these ovaries are putting out hormones, and they're they're at their highest peak and highest level when a woman's twenty plus or minus a couple years, and when a man is somewhere in that age group, and then they gradually decline over time. And then they undergo a major decline when the ovaries stop functioning, and they do, and they stop functioning, and that's when the period stops. And it doesn't matter whether one stops before the other. The main thing that is the experience is the gradual decline of all ovarian hormones. There's four of them. And then... The decline can be a little variable in the sense that the ovary puts out, for example, estrogen and progesterone, testosterone, and DHEA. And as far as estrogen and progesterone goes, the decline of progesterone can occur earlier and be more profound. Right. You get a woman into estrogen imbalance where she's got relative, even though she's got less estrogen than she had when she was 20, she's got a lot less progesterone enough that the progesterone is not balancing the estrogen. So the, 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 the end result is how much hormone you're circulating throughout your body. So it doesn't matter if one ovary is doing it or both ovaries are doing it. <clears throat> the, it it's just amazing to me that the classic pattern is one ovary puts out the egg one month and the next ovary and the other ovary puts out the egg the other month in a classic pattern. And who orchestrated that? Well, as you say, we should all go to medical school. <laughs> yeah. We'll figure it out, right? But practically speaking, you're really dealing with hormonal decline and then massive decline when the ovaries stop working entirely. And it doesn't matter if one stops before the other. And the actual truth for me is I don't know if one stops before the other. I have no way of telling out, and I haven't run across it in, in my pro prolific reading uh, in, the bottom line is those hormones go low and they need to be replenished. Oh, yeah. The maintenance of your brain, your arteries, your health, your bones. So if you'll allow me to take a diversion, not that I've ever taken a diversion, I'd like to take mm -hmm. a diversion. Okay. <laughs> and I'd like to speak to women, but I'd like to speak to in and specifically i'd like to speak to women and men in the fda 
in the National Academy of Sciences and in Congress. Because as everyone knows, I mean, as few people know, there has been a major effort to restrict and then end the ability of women and men to have any access to compounded bioidentical hormones. And this is serious and it's intense and it could happen very soon. And it's been a multi-year campaign that's been going on since the early 2000s. And it intensified a couple years ago when the FDA charged the National Academy of Science to research and, and, and comment upon the clinical utility of compounded bioidentical hormones. But there was an agenda there. And the agenda was to come up with evidence that they didn't work and they need to be stopped. There was an agenda there. It was a hidden agenda. And I assert, but I'm not going to go into the politics of it. I'd like to speak to the members of the FDA who came out with a report and the members of the National Academy of Science recommending that compounding end. That's what they did. They recommend that all access to compounding bioidentical hormones end. Well, that's consequential. More than half of the women in the United States being treated with hormones in menopause, more than half are choosing compounded bioidentical hormones. It's about 3 million women in the United States. And your access is being heavily challenged. So much so that we formed a major coalition, millions of dollars in effort is, is, is going on behind the scenes to protect your compounded bioidentical hormones. I'm actually the head of a coalition of professionals to do that. And the American uh, Pharmacy Compounders, or APC, are putting out a major effort to protect access to, there's probably eight to 10,000 compounding, bio, uh, compounding pharmacists in the United States. And lots of people are organizing, but I wanna mention this to you. So here's my statement to the members of the FDA and to Congress that I promise, I'm a medical doctor. I've been treating patients of all ages from delivering them as babies to participating in their leaving of earth in their 90s, they're, they're, they're passing away. I've treated patients of every single decade and every single age group. And you know, it gives physicians who do this a very, very unusual perspective. Right. We get, we get to see how's the health of people in their 20s in general, in 30s, in 40s, in 50s, in 60s, in 70s, in 80s. And here's what I've learned about human beings. People's health matters m majorly to them. And yeah. their life matters majorly to them. And their health and their life matters more and more as time goes on because as people age, if you talk to the elders in your family, you're gonna hear stories where their health isn't the same and it really matters to them. And the, and the quality of their life matters as much to a 90 year old as the quality of your life does in your 50s or 60s or whoever's listening, however old you are. And it matters absolutely as much my my mother in her late 80s it her well-being mattered tremendously to her as did my father and as health declines there's some adjustments that can be made but there's some adjustments that are very severe and the adjustments are when people lose their ability to think and women even more so than men not exclusively it's very, it's very common for them to have cognitive challenge that takes them out of the ability to do their professional work. And the cognitive decline can even reach the, uh, the level of dementia. They lose their thinking, their ability to think. And the majority of them do that. The women lose their ability to think clearly because of loss of hormones. And they lose, uh, we lose our muscles in a process called sarcopenia. 
And this ultimately leads to canes, wheelchairs, canes, walkers, wheelchairs. And women lose their bladder control because of two reasons, the loss of the muscle, sarcopenia, of the muscle that holds up the bladder in the uterus, plus vaginal atrophy from loss of estrogen. And people are usually familiar with the possibility of losing your bones. And people are not, women are not familiar with the, the massive protection that ovarian hormones confer to the coronary arteries and arteries everywhere. So that when women lose their hormones, they become vulnerable to heart attack. Half the women that leave the earth, leave the earth because of uh, complications of arterial sclerosis. Though when they're young, they're protected. So Congress people and FDA, your health is going to really matter to you. And it's going to matter more and more and more as you experience declines, which I presume some of you are. And you're, you're liable to discover that so many of these declines can be prevented. You don't have to make the transition from walking into a wheelchair and into an assisted living facility in a nursing home, as so many do. You don't have to lose bladder control. You don't have to lose your ability to think. You can take all this tremendous experience and expertise that you've developed in being in political life your whole, a lot, a lot of your adult life and not have it disappear because you can't think clearly or you're, 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 you have to go into an assisted living facility. You don't have to do any of that. And, and my assertion is over, well over 95% of human beings are going to lose everything I just mentioned and wind up in some kind of extended care facility. I see it a lot. And I, as a physician I, and, a, and as a son, I've seen it up close and personal. And uh, God bless the people in uh, mm -hmm. extended care facilities who are supporting our elderly. But the elderly would prefer to be at home. And that is a monumental change of life when they can no longer have uh, intimate I'm sorry, um, you know, can no longer be part of the family and the family's gatherings and the dinners and they, ha they have to leave home and go into an assisted living facility. So members of the FDA and Congress, uh, let me continue on my point. Some of you are going to discover that, oh my God, all this can be prevented and I can maintain my erection if you're a man. Or I can maintain my vagina and the ability to have intercourse along that long list of things that I've been mentioning here. I think I might be interested in hormones. And what I'm going to assert is because you guys have access to the highest quality, there is no doubt in the world, if you want the Tesla, if you want the excellence, you're gonna want compounded bioidentical hormones and there's no doubt. And you're not gonna want something that has so many limitations and doesn't even include testosterone, doesn't have estriol in it. If you do any research at all, you're gonna want those compounded bioidentical hormones for yourself because they are the best and they're head and shoulders, monumentally better quality. I'm not saying that the pharmaceutical manufactured hormones don't do some good, they do, but they have so many limitations because hormones are so powerful and how to get it right and to use the proper hormones, you're going to want compounded bioidentical hormones. You're going to want them so much. And Congress folks and the FDA, Congress principally, you're the ones who have control over whether these hormones are obliterated from the American access. And you may not even know that they're getting obliterated. <laughs> But they are in the process of doing that. And so I urge you, and I'm, I'm taking this break from our Thursday or Tuesday morning, <laughs> Tuesday morning, <laughs> to speak to you directly and request that it, it's going to matter to you greatly. Contact me directly. Find the most skilled and knowledgeable and experienced person in treating women and men in hormone, in menopause and Andropause with hormones, and they're all going to say the same thing. What are they choosing? What am I choosing as a doctor? What's my family, uh, the females in my family getting compounded bioidentical hormones? Because they are head and shoulders the highest quality and way above what's being offered 
out there by pharmaceutical manufacturers, and they'll never be able to do the level of individualization and specialization that is required for each individual woman who vary so much. You have to have these individualized prescriptions. So my request is don't let these things disappear from, don't let women lose all access to this or men lose all access to compounded bioidentical hormones. Just save them, just say, just say to the FDA, no, don't take these away from the American public. And women, please mobilize please go to two websites. One is called wethewomen.us. .us, that's different than .com, .org. wethewomen.us. Or for professionals, please go to the website cbhrtcoalition.org. So, you'll have a, uh, just a, a, a train load of good information and you'll have the ability to access via the APC website, ability to speak directly to your congressperson. They need to hear from you women or you will lose access to these. It's no. imminent. Yeah, we can't. I'm we so can't sorry to say I'm not here to, uh, you know, inject fear into all of us, but I am here to say with great concern, because I've been intimately involved with this since the early 2000s, when there was a major push to stop uh, compounding access to estriol, an American woman rose up, sent 77,000 emails to Congress, and Congress listened and prevented the FDA from uh, losing access to estriol. But this is much bigger. Right. And so, so anyway, Carolyn, uh, thank you for letting me stand on uh, the soapbox and really tell you. No, you I've gone through this with you since I met you. Yeah. And it was maybe like a mm -hmm. month in and you were invited to go to present in front of the National Academy of Science, Engineering and Medicine. I don't think you took a breath or you swallowed <laughs> during your presentation. Enter the amazing Jim Hernser, et cetera, et cetera. So <laughs> I will post this. Thank again. you. Um, on the ins and outs of menopause group. Thanks, there is a separate yeah. group, the CBHRT and the fate of our hormones in Washington group, which a lot more women are coming up on. And you can see the video we did do for We the Women. Shea Palza, thank you. God bless. You're <laughs> yes, amazing, yes. amazing. Thank woman. you and Jim Rock and our whole coalition. Shea Everybody. Palza. Yes. And so... We do, you know, I put that Patti Smith song up, you know, people have the power and it's really invigorating and we do and we can and we can let our voices be heard and not passively sit back and allow someone who is not a doctor to make the decisions as to what it is we take. It's twofold, is it not? We need our hormones, yes, but we also are entitled to our power of choice. Is that a yes? Oh, yes, that is. That's what I thought that women, point your women was. <laughs> and, and healthcare professionals, we have the right to choose best science. Yes. What serves our health the most. Correct. We Great. have the right to choose this. This is the United States of America. We have these rights. And these yeah. rights are being taken away from us. The threat is huge. You know, um, uh, I don't know what, Sherry, I think. Sherry, that's you. The FDA agenda is making me nervous. A lot of what the FDA does deeply concerns me. Get with us. We have a whole deal going on. We the women dot us. Join us because we are on fire. <laughs> we are, you know. And Dr. Rosen Sweet and Crew, the coalition of amazing physicians, compounding pharmacists, lobbying on their own dime in Washington, protected by laws of Congress to happily compound away. I mean, it's a big deal. <laughs> you got me all riled up. Thank you very much. <laughs> Yes, I did. <laughs> Didn't expect that one. <laughs> I'm just going to put that song back out there. 
<laughs> let people watch it and let them get riled up because Patty Smith is great and she believes in we the people absolutely and I know maybe I can find her somehow and through Daryl and see if she'll speak about we the women dot us because we have to save these hormones yeah for me I, 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 yeah, I can't even get the words out you know it's making all of us very nervous yeah well we, so, let's move, let's move on to today I mean this would be face oh, to, that, to that other question <laughs> yeah <laughs> I you think know that's what? what we're doing today. It's okay. The side where it's important. There are no mistakes, and that had to come out of your mouth for some reason because we're going to be in big trouble if we don't get into action. That, personally speaking, from my humble chair here. <laughs> it's my ballet background. Okay. This question. Um, <clears throat> And I, I'll, I'll get with everybody who's put up questions. Thank you so much, really. Um, this question blows my mind. With vaginal atrophy, um, many comments come from women who say that they do have vaginal atrophy. And some of them say that their clitoris has disappeared. This particular woman wants to know if this is really possible, as she does say that her clitoris has disappeared, can this happen? And if so, is it possible for the clitoris to reappear? Also, where did it go? I would like for it to come back, she says. Yes. <laughs> yes. It can disappear. Ooh. And it's got some similar mechanisms to male erections. Ah. And testicles and erectile function disappear in ma most males. The, what's so colossally illuminating is it's now occurring in males in their 50s and 40s. Holy mackerel. Yeah. And women, for example, who are on excessive testosterone or who are rubbing testosterone into the clitoral area, they can get enlargement of the clitoris. And gynecologists who are doing pelvic exams will often comment when they see an enlarged clitoris. And there are some of these um, enhancement creams that women apply to the clitoris, and they can have uh, some uh, in, enlargement of the clitoris. But it, it all comes and goes dependent on proper hormone levels. So if it's disappeared, there's a very decent i'll tell you if it's disappeared you got low androgens and you know you tend to think of testosterone for example as a male hormone and i try and break that fallacy my whole career testosterone is a human hormone it is absolutely is critically important to women as it is men for a wide variety of functions you do not have adequate testosterone, you're going to get sarcopenia, most likely, probably a greater than 95% level. That means you're going to lose your muscles. And as I said on this before, I can so clearly picture myself as a senior medical student listen, listening to a, a lecture by a gerontologist. They specialize in challenges of the elderly. And he said, you all know a thousand diagnoses as senior medical students. You've, you've learned so much. Let me tell you what's really happening to old people. Gerontologists saying, let me tell you what's really happening to old people. They're losing their muscles and they can't, it's called sarcopenia, and they can't walk or stand with stability and they, uh, they fall on their osteoporotic hips and in those days they die. So you wanna do something for elderly people help them preserve their muscles and their bones. And we're, they're all, and a woman loses her testosterone is every single woman that I've ever tested. We're talking hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of women. Every single woman that's three years beyond her last period has got low or super low testosterone and DHEA and the androgen metabolites. It, it's not optional. It's what happened. It's what's happening. 
And more and more these days, there's women who are going into perimenopause who've got low androgens, low testosterone, low DHEA, because they've overtaxed through recruiting testosterone along with estrogen for the biology of the stress response for fight or flight. So they've worn down the ability of the ovary to put this out. So, so many women in the perimenopause have lost their libido, getting tricep flab. Where'd that come from? Can't get off the floor, as spring off the floor as they used to be able to because of muscle strength. And I'm mentioning this because libido. How many women, what percentage of women did I see for the first time in perimenopause and menopause have libido? If I had to make a wild guess, I'd say 20%. 20% of women who had libido in their life don't have it or it's way diminished and the clitoris goes with it. And that was the question. Can the clitoris atrophy and can the clitoris restore? And here's the moral of the story. It's that cow back there is pretty, pretty happy about what you're saying. <laughs> this cow got all riled up by you, Carolyn Shapiro. <laughs> I'm honored. <laughs> This cow is totally taken off here because of you, I believe. I don't think it had anything to do with me. <laughs> you riled up this cow, Carolyn Shapiro. Again, I'm beyond honored. <laughs> <laughs> What's it saying? <laughs> it does not like the possible restriction and elimination of access to compound of bioidentical hormones. It's oh, very no, it does not. So, anyway, go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> libido, muscle strength, and even clitoris. Yes. So many women can get this small, medium, or majorly restored by replenishing hormones. In order yeah. to replenish your androgens, you have to use compounded bioidentical hormones because only injections are available. And I, I, I strongly recommend against injections. And it goes Heck back to... The needle in. Right. She said, I wonder what that sound was. That's pretty funny. It's a cow. Um, nevertheless, a riled up cow. Uh, it goes back to what you were saying um, about our uh, being, a, whatever that was, huge risk of losing our compounded bioidentical hormones. Yeah, because you'll lose, you'll lose testosterone. In any kind of topical form, bam, gone. Because only compounding bioidentical hormones. Now you got the birds riled up. Oh my God, Carolyn, this is all you. <laughs> you, can't, you can't make this stuff up. <laughs> How professional it is. It's just so if you want your muscles and your bones, if you want your muscles and your libido and your clitoris and your ability to orgasm, go out and shop for until you find a healthcare professional that has taken on becoming an expert at treating women in menopause with compounded bioidentical hormones. This is your job. It's to go shopping, find one of these experts. Check us out at the menopause method. Oh, man, yes. Man, I, I mean, of course, I love us the most. I love you guys. Other knowledgeable folks, too. And so that's your job. Anyone watching this Facebook Live, go shopping until you find someone who's specializing in treating women in menopause with compounded bioidentical hormones, and you trust them. That's your job. It, from, that point on, you'll do it, from that point on, you're going to do a teamwork together and you're going to arrive at something that's going to last you your whole life, including your clitoris. Yeah. And orgasm, and libido, et cetera. Oh, my God. I mean, the things that can happen in menopause are just wild. And, yeah, and uh, andropause, too. I mean, you talk to a man who's lost his erection. No, he's not happy. Lost his, lost his drive and lost his Christmas and lost his decisiveness. Well, men don't admit this as frequently as women do, but okay. talk to one and see how they feel about it. Not good is the answer. So it's happening to men and women.
I don't want to get angry. <laughs> Next. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Okie dokie. So, um, can you explain the difference between, because this is what we're talking about, really. Can you explain the difference between a hot flash and a warm rush? Um, we know that we can become symptomatic by taking too much or too little. But if a hot flash turns into a warm rush, is that indicative that we're making progress at finding our right doses? Um, there's two parts to that. The a human female body does not like low hormones. Right. And it's stressful. Yeah. And it puts out some chemicals to try and rescue it is the best I've understood it. And it causes something called a vasomotor phenomena, where you get this massive dilation of surface blood vessels. So the blood rushes to the surface of the skin and you feel warm all over because the blood at the core of your body is warmer. And you get these warm rushes. Well, it's really a spectrum. Some women don't have any warm rushes. They're still stressed by low hormones, but they don't feel it. Some women start getting these mild vasomotor responses, and they're getting these things called warm rushes. Some women, it's more intense, and that warmth phenomena gets more than just warmth. It gets hot, and so you call those hot flashes. And sometimes that heat is so severe that it'll wake up women in the middle of the night who've broken out in a sweat so profound that they have to change their nightwear because they've broken out in this huge sweat. Night sweats, they're called. They're all part of the spectrum of these vasomotor phenomena, they're called. And they're, what are they caused by? Low estrogens. So what's the remedy? Replenish the estrogens. And it works beautifully. And we don't stop. And then, you know, the second part of that question was if we had severe hot flash or we had hot flashes and now we're starting to get warm rushes, does that represent progress? Yes, it does. The, the vasomotor phenomena are milder. They're not as severe. They're not as intense. But that's not the end game. In most every single woman, there's a few exceptions. We, we can reduce those to zero. Or some women, we can get them so mild and so rare that it doesn't matter. <laughs> you know? well, right. And, and they're getting all the other advantages of um, replenishing estrogens, which are there are so many. It's outrageous how important it is to replenish estrogens and progesterone and testosterone and DHEA and thyroid, et cetera. These are our power biochemicals. There's nothing more powerful in your body than these biochemicals, these hormones. There's no more powerful biochemicals. <laughs> CoQ10 is wonderful and we need it desperately, but it doesn't, it's not as powerful and as immediate acting. Vitamin A, you know, you name it. There's magnesium, there's zillions of things in our body that are so important to us, but they're not as powerful as these, even neurotransmitters. The, correct. Hormones, most powerful, neurotransmitters, probably second as far as feeling something. So, at any rate, <laughs> another short answer to a, a quote, simple question, right? If there is such a thing. Well, you're subjective and you're you, so you can't understand how it is for us to hear you give us this amazing information, I think. Um, and I, I get the, you know, the, the, the private messages telling me so. Yeah. so. <laughs> I have no problem with you're just taking over the show because your information is fabulous. Um, and much appreciated, much appreciated. Um, <clears throat> we spoke of, um, DHEA in our last interview, and I guess we can close out with, um, this one. Uh, for today. The question um, this time is that why it is we would need DHEA if we're already making so much of it. Um, we, I know that we re, that we visited this last uh, interview, but what would happen if a person takes 
if a person takes too much DHEA, I'm, I'm frightened of what these consequences could be. I think that's a good question. Yeah, DHEA is more subtle than any other hormone that you can name, such as thyroid. Nobody's, very few people are going to take too much thyroid hormone. They're going to feel so awful. They're going to get right, so right, angry right. and tremorous and have heart palpitations and feel mentally, emotionally off. So there's an internal protection to these powerful biochemicals called hormones. If you take too much of them, you feel terrible because they're so strong. And so it's, again, that pharmacological optimal window. You want to be there. You don't want to be too high or too low. No way. And you're not going to do that with thyroid because you're going to feel too weird if you take too much. And you're not going to do it with estrogen either if you're paying attention. You're going to feel too weird because estrogen is so strong that you get too much. Most women are going to feel very uncomfortable and there's a long list of symptoms. And in the menopause method, we have this. In fact, I think an email has been set out just to give this, all women access to this. Um, and it's a symptom chart. It's too much and too little. What's too much estrogen look like? And you're not going to do it with progesterone either because it's too strong. You take too much progesterone, you're going to be so groggy and drunk feeling. You're not going to want to do it. And too much testosterone, women are going to get too testosterone. They're going to get too irritable and intense and mood disturbances and stuff. You're not going to want to do it, most women. DHEA, here's some things about DHEA. It's the most prevalent steroid hormone or pro-hormone in our body. There's more DHEA than there is any of this stuff. So there must be a reason for it. That's what I've learned about the human body design. If it's there, there's a reason for it. And not only that, there's a good reason for it. And all that <laughs> stuff around the appendix being like, you don't need an appendix. Yeah. Consoles. The creator of all designed the human body, but there was a few throwaway parts in there, right? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think you want to just go in and have some operations that remove some of these throwaway parts. And then that includes when you've got the most prevalent steroid hormone coming out of the adrenal gland and the ovary and the testicle, DHEA, you don't want to go just disregard it and say, well, it doesn't really matter. It does matter. The, this, the difference between DHEA is the immediate symptoms of insufficient DHEA or too much DHEA are not apparent. Now, the long-term effects of too much DHEA will become apparent because DHEA is going to be converted in your body into testosterone, the androgens, or even uh, other steroid hormones like estrogen. There's pathways to do that. So eventually you're going to get into overdose of these other hormones. And so the symptoms of overdose are going to be the symptoms of excessive androgens such as pimples, oily skin, irritability, test too testosterone-ish, hair on your chin, hair in your mustache area, hair where you don't want it. That's going to be one of the long-term symptoms of too much DHEA. But let me give you a simple guideline around DHEA because DHEA is available over the counter. Women, do not take more than 15 milligrams of DHEA. Thank you. Orally. 15 milligrams. Did I say 15? One five. Equals One five, 15. Three times five. More than 15 milligrams. And even 15 milligrams is going to be a little too much for a small number of women. So don't take more than 15 milligrams a day. Problem, when you go into your local um, pharmacy, the corner pharmacy, big box, you can find DHEA at 25 milligrams and 50 milligrams OTC, over the yeah. counter. Don't yeah. do it. Yeah. Don't take it. It's going to be too much for you. And how am I going to know that? Well, I had a mentor tell me, Alan Gaby, bless your heart, Alan Gaby. Goodness, you've done on this planet, Alan Gaby, MD. And I, I shadowed him decades and decades ago. 
And he said, look, no woman should be taking more than 15 milligrams of DHEA. And it's and I've borne that out on 24-hour urine hormone tests. You see some of these women are coming on 25 milligrams. They got too much DHEA in the metabolites. So, yeah, DHEA is a little different. It's much more subtle. You're not necessarily going to feel DHEA deficiency, and you're not necessarily going to see overdose. But a guideline, don't take more than 15 milligrams of DHEA orally. Oh, look at that. You can take DHEA orally, and it will work. We, uh, we always start out with testosterone uh, mixed with DHEA so that it's uh, the mixture a woman's getting it topically. My favorite way to do it. Right. Oral hormones, problematic. Oral testosterone, don't ever do it. I don't even think you can do it. You. It, it can injure a liver. Right. Right. Oral estrogen. It's done a lot of good on this planet, but there are some side effects that you do not want to have. And you got to use much higher doses if you're going to do it orally. Right. The proper body levels of it. Oral testosterone and oral estrogen, no, don't do it. Oral cortisol, if you need it, it's pretty rare that you do. That's okay. Oral progesterone, I prefer topical, but I'll go to oral in a heartbeat, in a flash. Because oral progesterone is good and it can help to give special benefit for sleep. Oral DHA, perfectly acceptable. Just don't go, women don't go over 15 milligrams. Men have, men can take more, but not women. Oral thyroid works fine. That's the main route that we give thyroid. So there's some ideas that'll, that one minute after the hour <laughs> on our mild mannered Facebook Live, very mild mannered day to day. Carolyn, what did you say? <laughs> I'm sorry for laughing out loud, but that was funny. I enjoy riling up a bunch of cows. I mean, yes, I don't know if I've ever had that experience. <laughs> Look how they've quieted down since you got off your your uh, intense, passionate. My high horse. <laughs> no pun. <laughs> cows totally quieted down. And that bird, whatever the heck that was. Woo-wee. It's kind of like a day in the life of where I live, but with people. <laughs> Woman comes up and we'll close out with this because you know the pages I love, but I don't know if I should say. You can download the book, Happy Healthy Hormones, from this very group, the PDF version. And as I always say, pages 326 and 327 do have a version of that chart. She's asking, where can I find the symptom chart uh, Dr. Rosensweet just showed? Email? Thanks. Do you have an it's answer? In, it's in the book, and an email went out, and if you contact um, the menopause method, we can get you a copy. And, you know, we should post that. If you, uh, if you would talk to Joshua, Carolyn, you can post that card on the Instagram. Cool. Okay. Yeah, I have a link. Um, for, but I'm happy to post the card. I live by yeah. that card. I know. I do. I sleep know. with that card. I love that card. <laughs> that card just has. You don't think sleeping with that card might be a little excessive, do you? <laughs> well, I don't sleep, so I don't oh. see that there's any good point in it. No, I'm just kidding. Um, yes. And you know, my dear, I, I need I know to you gotta go. Out. Yeah. Hard stop. Oh, well. So. Very enjoyable um, interview. Thank you so much. And we'll see you on Thursday. I'll write to you ladies. I'll get those links up. Please be a part of our effort to save our hormones. So important. You rock, Dr. R. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Carolyn. I'll see you on I Thursday. I will see you on Thursday. To all the women, everybody, enjoy. Have a great day. Laugh a lot. <laughs> see you later. Bye-bye.